Hello and welcome to the Thursday show on our game with myself, Michael Verney. Delighted to have uh, former Ballyhale Shamrocks boss James O'Connor with me. James, how are you? Good, Michael. Or should we say Joxer? And I'm wondering where the Joxer, where the Joxer originate? Hardin Stuckart. Well, I tell you now, you're, you're going back a lot of years now to find out that one, I can tell you. It started at a primary school level, but it's a long story and I'm definitely not getting into that. <laughs> Good man. That's uh, that's something I always, that's an off the record one when maybe when we go yeah. off air, I'd say. <laughs> uh, James, great to have you with us. You obviously have a, a very particularly unique insight into uh, Bally Hale and Bally Gunner meeting. Um, when I say Bally Hale and Bally Gunner, I presume it's very tinged with, with bad memories from last February, I assume. Ah, sure, look, um, I thought that was a tough day. Um, and the weeks to follow, you know, Michael. But look, uh, in fairness, um, look, it, it, it was an, an, an unbelievable experience to be there, you know, and to work with the lads for, you know, for the best part of two years. So, cause, um, look, just look, you'll go back and, you know, through every minute of that game, um, I suppose I've gone through it a thousand times at this stage, but like, look, that's not going to change the result at the end, unfortunately. Um, but look, they're, they're, look, here they are back again in an, an, an all ends semi final. Uh, you've watched it back several times, I assume. Like, um, what, like, what goes through your head when you watch back that goal? It's mad. I watched it a couple of times during the week as well. It, it's so crazy, even because. Just looking back, like Paddy Levy was so lucky to even get the ball in his hand at one stage. He did, got a bad pass and all of a sudden everything just opened up. Like what, What's going through your head when you're looking at that from the sideline? Well, just before the, the last puck out, um, I remember walking down the sideline and I looked down at the, at the Ballygunner bench and Darrell Sullivan was walk, walking I suppose, towards me at that stage and his head was down and you could just see he was after giving up really, you know. And... Uh, Next thing, the puck out came. Dean Mason lobbed it out. It landed very close to me over the sideline. And there was uh, Owen Cody, Adrian Mullen, um, went for the ball. And they both missed the, the, the pickups at the time, you know. And it just broke out around the middle and down the field in. And, you know, I just couldn't believe uh, Harry Rudden latched onto it. And, you know, he was still a, a long ways out at that stage. And I still thought to myself, look, he's not going to score from there. You know, he's not going to get a goal from out there, like, you know. Worst case scenario, a point. But like he just took a low shot and all I remember was the, the crowd at that end, the Ballygunner crowd just leaping it up, just leaping it up the, into the air. And I just couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe it. You know, you're there then and you're looking at the clock and time is up, you're in injury time and uh, you're just hoping he'll give you an extra maybe minute or so on the puck out. But to the very minute, the puck out came and was over and that was it. It, it was one of those things, it was like, you know, it was like a knockout at the end of the 12th round with no time to come back, like, or no time to even get up. Uh, as you yeah. said, it was, there was no time even for a puck out. And Harry Ruddle's shot as well, it's, it's so difficult in Hurland to score a goal from there. But it was, from his point of view, it was perfect. Richie Reid was half obstructing Dean Mason. I think Joey might have been as well. For, yeah. a goalkeeper, for a goalkeeper, it bounced in an awful spot for Mason. And he got over quite quick. But it's just one of these kind of mad shots that um, it was just going to be hard stopping no matter who was in there. I, I saw some people apportioning a bit of blame to Dean and I, I just don't see that at all. I think it was yeah, I agree, yeah. the, the, per, the perfect shot and the perfect shot for a forward and the most imperfect shot for a keeper. So difficult to save. And like when you're standing on the line and it's like, you know, one minute, you know, you're three in a row all Ireland champions, and the next you don't even get a puck out. There's a I think you had your hands in your head after. Like it must be so hard to believe. Well, you're just trying to take it all in, Michael, you know, and you know, like from going from 30 seconds earlier, you know, you're nearly picturing, you know, Colin Finley walking up the steps, and next thing, you know, here you are walking out in the middle of the field. You belly gunner lads jumping and, and, and crying all around, you know, with, with, with joy. And you're just kind of saying, what the hell happened there? Like, yeah. Um, um, tough one. It, yeah. <laughs> I'd, say that, I'd say that's an understatement. Um, uh, what do you think, just briefly looking at the game on Sunday, it's a spicy one. There's no point in saying any different. You saw the hurt that was in the dressing room uh, of the Bally Hale lads. There's something I want to ask you as well. Colin referenced the... Uh, Barry Coughlin's speech after the Leinster final. Like mm. at the time, at the time, did you take uh, did you take any insult or any disrespect from from his words at the time? I'd be honest with you, Michael. Um, I didn't even hear his speech at the time, and that's the honest to God truth. 
Um, I have references uh, to it after, but you know, after I came out around the middle of the field, I was listening to no speech. I, 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 I promise you, you know. Um, so look, it was only afterwards I heard about it. I didn't read it. Uh, to be honest with you, I, did, I didn't read a whole lot into it. Um, like, look, we had to face the dressing room afterwards. I was in, the, um, you know, obviously I had to go back into the Valley Hill dressing room uh, first of all and speak to the lads, um, and then. You know, we'd say I made my way down to the Ballygunner dress room, saw two complete diff- different a- atmospheres, as you could well imagine. Um, so, no, look, to go back to your original question, I did not, I didn't hear the speech at the time, and I didn't pay too much attention, to be honest with you. No, I actually listened back to it yesterday, just to, you know, it's one thing seeing the words on paper, it's another thing actually hearing what he said, and I have to say, I don't think he, he meant any disrespect, but you've been involved in plenty of dress rooms where motivation will be, any crumbs of motivation will be taken will be taken from anywhere, uh, and it's kind of funny as well that Colin referenced Barry Coughlin, and they're probably going to mark each other, and I would have thought yeah. the winner of that duel would probably go a long way, so I'd say that'll be, that'll be fairly hot and heavy between the two of them, I'd say. Definitely, like, look, um, two great players, you know, two very physical men. Um, and look, I know that Bally, I know both dressing rooms pretty well, but the Bally Hill dressing room, like, you know, if you get the mean, the real mean focus, Bally Hill coming out onto a field, that's a different animal that, you know, than I suppose sometimes you can see Bally Hill, you know, playing championship matches and, 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 and what have you. And look, they're obviously a fantastic team, but that, you know, that ruthless streak might be in them. Uh, on any given day, but when they get their heads together, and like I know from from being inside that dress room of a Friday night before championship, um, those guys would sit down, they'll talk it out between them, um, you know, I suppose with each other, and I can tell you now, any bit of motivation that can be got will be spoken outside that dress room, and they will bring that to the field. I think you're going to see the ruthless belly runner, or sorry, the ruthless uh, belly hail uh, on Sunday. Um, Two great teams taking the feed. Look, in, in, in my book, two of the best teams over the last number of years. Um, and it's going to be a very interesting, uh, Jewel, I think, being honest with you. Uh, yeah, my only problem is that it clashes with the World Cup final. And I know we're yeah. all GM and, and we're all sports people as well. And I just think it, I think we're taking away the casual fan who would love to be watching this. But I still think it's probably... I think it's probably the biggest club game since Fortumna played Bally Hale in 09 in that All Ireland Club mm-hmm. semi final in Turles, which was huge as well. But you saw the hurt in the dressing room in February. Colin Fenley has talked about, you know, he wasn't sure whether he'd be hurling again. By all accounts, Joey Holden, you know, he's not supposed to be here. He's not supposed to be playing. He's supposed to be traveling yeah. the world. Um, but you do expect that kind of ruthless streak to come out. They do have, it's amazing to say, for a team that has won what they've won, they feel like they have a massive point to prove at the weekend. They do. And like, look, the one thing I know about them would say, when they're in that mood and when they're in that, uh, that mind space, they're a very dangerous team. Um, again, like I said, no, I promise you this week now, they're focusing in on their game. They'll have their game plan. They won't be over-exerting themselves, sparing everything to, I suppose, for Sunday. But, I'm sure now, tomorrow evening, they'll probably meet for the last time tomorrow evening. They'll sit down inside that dressing room. Those players, there'll be four or five players stand up and, and speak inside that dressing room. And they'll go back and they'll talk about the hurt of last February. And like the one thing about them, they're a very, very proud club. And look, they like they like winning. There's no point saying otherwise. They used to be in there. And, you know, look, their crown was taken from them, you know, last February. And they'll want that back. That's 100% sure. And, you made a reference there to, to Joey and uh, to Colin. Like, look, I knew by talking to the lads, even, you know, we said the week for the island last year, they were going away. Uh, and I, I knew Colin would probably come back during the summer, but Joey was the head away for, we'd say, for two years, two to three years traveling. So um, in my mind, he was definitely gone for the coming year. But to have him back, Joey Holden to that team, is, is he's a rock to that defense. Um, and not alone what he brings on the field, but what he brings in the dressing room as well before and after games is 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 massive. Um, you know, the lads listen to him. He's a guy who, do, you know, he, you won't hear Joey saying too much during games or anything like that. But when he speaks, everyone just sits up and listens, you know. And he's a guy, you know, he's he's one of the best speakers that I've come across inside the dressing room. Um, and, like, that's amazing to say when you have the likes of Colin and the, and, and the likes of TJ in there, you know. TJ is actually a very quiet fella inside the dressing room. And probably every fella would think, you know, TJ is the, you know, the driving force inside the dressing room. He's actually one of the quieter lads inside. 
he kind of lets his, you know, his hurling kind of, I suppose, do the speaking side of it, you know. But um, Joey's a massive fan inside that dressing room. And so was Colin. Like, look, Colin was, he was my captain last year. And those two guys, they'll drive it all the time inside. But I'd love to be a fly on the wall in that dressing room tomorrow evening. That's what yeah. I would <laughs> They brought, they brought. I think Henry came in for before the county final. Um, so it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see what motivation they look for here. Just going to fly through a few quick comments, James. Uh, mm-hmm. Horace Grace, regular viewer, just says a wounded cat is a dangerous animal. Uh, definitely is. It just follows up. Expect a ferocious backlash from the Shamrocks. Can't see Bally Gunner been able for Mike Sinnott. Just says uh, a bit, a good bit of loose talk coming out of Bally Gunner. Seen Wayne Hutchinson saying before the Munster Club final, I think it was the semi final, that he could only see Club All Ireland going to Munster this year. That was before the Bally Gunner and the Pearson game. He actually said it to me. It was music to my ears when he said it to me because it was a very top provoking yeah. line. It was a very top provoking line. Uh, Richard Hogan just has a question for you here, James. Um, yeah. It was tougher to take for Ballyhale, given that they probably heard their best game in that final. Would James think that would be a fair assessment of last year from a Ballyhale perspective? There was probably a lot of ups and downs and maybe yeah. a couple of miss, miss starts, but like you did, you were delivering your probably your best performance in the year of that final up until the last seconds. One hundred percent. And again, just going back to what I said previously, like you know, um, Ballyhale are a team. Look, obviously, again, look, they're a fantastic hurling team. But they might not have produced that 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 big game every single day, but they'll do enough to win. Um, it's it's a bit like a good racehorse, you know. He might kill himself every day, but he get his head in front, you know, uh, on most days. And that for me, like looking back at last year, I thought that best performance was the All Ireland. I'll be honest with you. I thought everything that we that we planned out and the way we structured everything, I thought it worked. Um, and unfortunately, look, the last thirty seconds caught us, but. Like, overall, I thought that was a very, very strong performance. And, like, again, you know, they were missing Rona Cochran that day. I think Rona is, I thought he was a huge loss last year, I'll be honest, because he's a midfielder who chips in with three or four points every single day. And, you know, we probably didn't get that return last year from, you know, from around the middle of the field. Uh, by all accounts, he I think he had a, a head knock for the, the Leinster final. So hopefully it's a case of where mm-hmm. he's back fully fit. And I know if Bally Gunner are playing Bally Hale that they want to be playing them with a full outfit and I'm sure Bally yeah. Hale are, are the same. Uh, just looking at uh, matchups, is there anything maybe outside of Colin, maybe and Barry Coughlin, is there anything, um, any matchups you're looking forward to in particular? Like Patrick Fitzgerald is a headache that you didn't have last year as yeah. Bally Hale Shamrock's manager and it's no longer, you know, trying to hold Desi, it's trying to hold Patrick Fitzgerald inside and probably, you know, one of the Mahonies as well. But is there any duel in particular that you're looking forward to? I think it'd be interesting with uh, Owen Cody uh, probably Ian, and Ian Kenny um, for Sunday. Like Owen would probably would say, I suppose by his standards last year would have been quite in the final, you know, because he was a guy that was rehurling fierce well for us uh, all year, and you know was probably our top forward. Um, be interesting to see, you know, how 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 Bally gonna um, handle him again for uh, this year, you know, because um, Owen, Owen for me himself and Adrian Mullen, today, there are two guys. Coming into their prime now, the Adrian Mullen, especially this year, I think is hurling very well for um for Bally Hale. You know, he's a real engine on him and you know, he's the kind of guy he can be he can start in the half hour line, drift into midfield, and he even goes deeper again to get ball. So he's a guy that I think will do, you know, he'll hit a lot of ball on Sunday. But himself and Owen, I think, will be that if the two of them hit form on Sunday, um, I think I, I do think Bally Hale will be able to massive shout. Uh, looking at Ballyhale, I'd say the last two days, was there would there have been a bit of worry as a former manager looking back at them? I thought they were overran a few times, particularly around the middle of the park. Uh, and even the last day, when Kilmacud got that purple patch, um, like they like they fairly made the most of it. I think it was 1 7 to no score during that purple patch. Do you expect Adrian even to play a bit deeper, maybe, than he has? And obviously, as you yeah. said about Ro- Ronan Corkin, is crucial there because they can't allow, like, if Bally Gunner break the line like Nace did and at times like Kilma could did, they'll go for the throat and they'll put them away. Yeah, 100%. Like, I think, now look, I haven't heard what the, what, what the Bally Hale team is, but for me, you know, uh, Paddy Mullen and Ronan Corkin are, are, are the two best midf- uh, midfielders that they have. Uh, I can see Adrian drifting in there as well, I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, creating a very strong line across the middle. And those guys walking back to their half back line as well, you know. Um, like for me, that's where this game is going to be won. I think around the middle around that middle third, like Belly um Belly gonna have a great habit of winning ball around there and giving the perfect ball in inside the forward line. Um and if you let him do that, they'll they'll absolutely skin you. And like you mentioned there now, 
you have Fitzgerald as well, and then you have Desi inside that. Like you've two, you've two absolute top class forwards inside that now. So if you know, if if you're letting them win ball around the middle third and giving them the perfect ball inside, it'll be almost impossible trying to defend it. Yeah, uh, forget. For, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Would would I be right in saying, uh, somewhat right in saying that? Instructions to Darren Mullen in last year's final were: no matter what Desi does, just don't let him around you, because he seemed happy yep. enough. He seemed happy enough just to hold him, and it's almost like if Desi gets that ball there, limit the damage. The goal kind of was a, not a bit of a freak, but he took that very well. But would that be yeah. fair to say that it was just stand him up and just do not let him around you? If you have to give me a yard to strike, give me a yard to strike, but don't let him take you on. It is, yeah, it was. Look. Um... Obviously, look, Desi's a, it, Desi, he's a key forward inside there. Um, and in fairness to Darren, like, Darren is a really good marker. Like, Darren would probably be on the Kilkenny team at the moment, bar injuries over the last number of years. He'd been fierce and lucky. Um, but he's a, re- you know, he's a real good uh, attacking cornerback, you know. But he can do both jobs. You know, he can do the marking job and he can, like, Darren would, he would, would be as equally as good out in the half-back line. Um, but I guess we did tell him that he was doing a man-marking job. You know, if, if, he, does, if he does beat you, don't foul him. Make him shoot. You know, keep him, keep him out of the wing as much as possible. You know, so yeah, we need you. Uh, but then on the flip side of that, you know, someone's going to pick up Desi, but it's kind of almost yeah. allowed. It's almost allowed Patrick Fitzgerald to flourish because Desi Desi's playing really well, but he's still getting the same amount of attention as he was. And it is, you know, it's, maybe there's a bit more space the other side. And Fitzgerald has just come in. Like you've probably seen him fairly closely, and you know, Waterford underage hurling that. But he's made like outside of the county final when he was quiet, maybe on a a horrible day against Mount Sion. He has made some impact at senior level. He hasn't. He's only a guy like of eighteen or nineteen. And believe it or not, I actually didn't see a whole lot of him up or uh, only up to around the county semi final this year. Um, but like, look, he's a real talent. Um, and he's very similar. He's very similar uh, to Desi in 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 a lot of ways. But he's one of those forwards now. Like, look, he's, he's as I said, he's eighteen, nineteen. But he's gaining confidence as 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 he's going. You know. So, uh, look, for a guy, you know, playing the way he is, you know, I suppose as far as his age, which is incredible, but he's a dangerous forward. And, like, I think this guy over the next two or three years will be will be a top-class player, I'd be honest. Yeah, we're chatting to Owen Kelly the other day at the, the Co-op Superstores, Munster Hurling League launch, and he just, you know, we were saying, like, is he too young to get to, to be given a go at Waterford next year? And he said, far from it. Like, he actually said he'd probably have a softer landing at county level because he's playing with you know one of the best club teams in the yeah. country and getting plenty of attention just go fly through a few more comments I think you've covered a few of these uh, you might ask James how much of a loss was Ronan Corcoran in last season's final I think you kind of yeah, alluded to yeah. how big of a loss he was uh, Owen Cody disappointed in last year's final does James see him making a major difference this year I think actually I think you might have covered yeah. that one <laughs> you might have covered that yeah. one as well uh, Parra Grace just says St Thomas is in the line. he must be loving the build up to the second semi-final yeah both are kind of flying in under the radar but we'll chat about them in a minute uh, and Bally Gunner he, Andrew Sullivan says Bally Gunner going to win by about five points um, you're obviously uh, a Liz Moore man a Waterford man like yeah. where, where do it's a difficult one. Where do your loyalties uh, lie on Sunday? Um, a team representing Waterford or a team you've managed for a couple of years? It's kind of a difficult one. It's a difficult one, and you know I've I've been asked this you now uh, over the last two weeks. I'll be honest with you, and uh, my simple answer to this, I suppose, to this one is I'm definitely going to sit this one out. Uh, so I'm going on the fence on this one. But the one thing that I want to say is that it look there's, it's going to be a fantastic game on Sunday. Um, you've two of the best teams in the country going at it, um, and like you know, look, uh, I'm expecting a high-scoring game, uh, a real attacking game because you have two, you have two teams. I know Bally going to play to a structure, um, but Bally Hale are a team. You know, they're just they're a magical team. They can do magical things on any given day. You know, and you know as much as you know, I'm sure I'm sure Pat and the lads have their have their game plan and structure in place. But like you can't curtail the likes of a uh, TJ Reid or a Colin Finley. They'll do things instinctively, and you know they'll create magic anyway. Like that's what everyone wants to see uh, in an all semi semi-final. Can I just ask you? Actually, you were you were one of three managers during this spell with with Ballyhead. It's a very difficult mm-hmm. thing for a group of players to, no matter how talented they are, to adapt to two years with Henry, two years with yourself, uh, with Pat yeah. and Jimmy Matter and the and the boys now. Like that's a fair testament of the group as well, and how they've just been able to adapt to that. Because you can see lads almost switching off when a new manager comes in, or it's maybe sometimes yeah. it can be too much change. Like uh, talk to me. You mentioned about Joey and the lads. 
is there great ownership taken by the players in that dressing room? They say most great teams are driven by players in the dressing room and the manager just facilitates. Is that kind of the case in Ballyhale? Well, what you have, what you have in Ballyhale is leaders. You know, you've guys inside in that dressing room. You know, if things, if games weren't going their way and players weren't pulling their weight, you'd be called out. You know, this is, it's not a case where you go into a dressing room and you have 25 or six fellas sitting down inside and they're all hiding inside in the corner and afraid to open their mouths. That's not Ballyhale now. You know, they, you will be called out or, you know, if there's misdemeanors during the year, you'll be called out on it. Um, and that's what I absolutely loved about them. You know, because look, I, I've been inside other dress rooms as well. Not many, thank God, that, you know, players will hide and, you know, guys won't call out other guys. You know, and it's amazing, like, you know, because for me, Ballyhale, they're a real country club. You know, even, even to such a way that I remember one day during the summer, uh, we were training there last year and... Um, uh, I was looking for Ron and I couldn't I couldn't see him. And here he was in the field, like uh, just right behind the goal, and he bailing here and he waving in at us as we were waiting for training. So you know. Um they're just an amazing group like that. Like, but no, look, come back to your original question. Um like they will they'll take ownership of it. Um look, I think it's great credit from, you know, even for the club the way they bring in outside uh, outside managers and they come in and like every guy has his own techniques and methods and what have you like but in fairness to the belly here lads they'll listen you know like no matter what you have to say they'll they'll listen and you get to try it out if it doesn't work you probably go back to what you were doing you know but uh yeah. otherwise otherwise like they will like you know they, they are very open they're very open and they're guys that um they're guys you know that uh, take fierce pride in their in their hurling there you know so no a, a great bunch like that your phone was ringing there. I'd say it was Pat Hoban telling you to keep keep stomach. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just I'm ask you? Down you drive out. <laughs> yeah, potentially, potentially. Um, you obviously have seen Bally Gunner at fairly close quarters as well. Um, they've probably gone to another level. Would it be fair to say, James? From it's almost like the release of pressure, getting getting over the hump, winning that All Ireland has. I I think they've gone to another level. I think the second half against Napierschig was. I put that up there with anything they've done over the last three years, and I'd probably say that it has exceeded anything they've done. Um, they're a really dangerous animal from the point of view now that while it might have been thrown at them before, that they weren't able to win games when push came to shove, really yeah. in those clutch moments. Like they look nerveless now in those kind of clutch moments, which is uh, again, the bar has been raised for Bally Hale, I'd say, going into Sunday, mm-hmm. based on what Bally Gunner have done this year so far. It is, but I would say for Bally Gunner. After they winning the All Ireland last year, I think it was a fierce monkey off their back. Like the pressure that's on water clubs here trying to do well in this competition is 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 huge. Like you know, and like look, we don't have a tradition of kind of winning All Irelands, whether it be inter county or club. Um, so for them to win that, I actually think it's probably worth four or five points a game to them now. Um, and again, you asked me the question: Are they better? Are they a better team now than what they were twelve months ago? I would probably say yes. Um, because they have that belief now. There is, you know, there's no hesitation there now anymore. The monkeys off their back. They're kind of playing with a bit more freedom, I think, as well. Like I was very impressed with the Pierce second half, I'll be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Um like I was I was watching that game the first time and I said, geez, you know what? I think Bally are in trouble. But you know, they just lifted the gears at half time, came out in the second half, just a different team. And they showed that real class and look, they have some they have some great players and some very classy players inside them. So, yeah, I do think they're a better team than last year. Yeah, they um they have an ability to problem solve now during matches yeah. that, they, that they mightn't have had before. And a lot of that, I think, just comes from belief. Interesting you said about Ballyhale and about like lads being called out. Um, It's funny when I have been in dressing rooms as well where lads are hiding and uh, Generally, if you're hiding in the dressing room, you're hiding on the pitch as well. So it's a great, yeah. it's a great, it's a great sign of a team that they are calling each other out uh, and raising those standards. Just can I have a quick word, James, on uh, Thomas's and Dunloy Cucullins in the other semi final? You know Thomas is fairly well, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would put their sixty minutes against G up there with anything they've produced over the last while. I think that is probably the peak of what they've done. Uh, they obviously finished on the on the wrong side. But like you know, you know full well and firsthand what they can do. Like they, they seem to be only be getting better. And again, like Bally Gunner, they have found a way to win games. They were under pressure mm-hmm. a lot great both days probably, and still came through. They're probably overwhelming enough favourites going into that semi final. I'd say. Yeah, probably. Look, like my view on last year uh, with them was that I actually thought they were the best team we played last year. 
that was my that was my um, view on him. The one thing that I couldn't get over, and I remember, you know, being on pitch side with him, and the physical size of him. They're 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 a huge team. Like I consider Ballyhill probably you know probably one of the biggest teams in the country physically. Um, but I just couldn't get over the St. Thomas's lads. Jeez, they were huge. And like I remember, there was one there was one there was one clash of bodies uh, during the game where uh, Paddy Mullen. I uh, got a belt of a shoulder off of um yeah. I, I I think it was uh Cooney at, at centre yeah. forward. And he That's right, and yeah. he absolutely and he absolutely leveled it. Now I've never seen Paddy Mullen been put on the floor before in two years. Um you know, it was just it was just they're a hugely physical team and they have some again they have some very good defenders um and really quick forwards as well. So I rate them highly. Look, you saw what it came down to Last year against them, like you know, it came down to a, a TJ free twenty one yards out uh, to win it. Uh, but I was high, highly impressed with him, and I know, and I know from afterwards that that loss really hurt them as well. So I think they have a massive motivation with that. Um, but like I expect them to be right in the mix as well at the end. Like who, look, whoever will win Sunday between the two teams, they're going to have a massive, another massive challenge again um, with St Thomas's. Yeah, I think anybody that says the Bally Bally Hale Bally Gunner game is a de facto final is uh, totally missing the point. I have to say, oh, totally um, wrong, yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually mentioned um, Finton Burke said after he said not all the lads might admit it, but all thirty of them were bawling crying after after that. They'd put everything into that last year, and it definitely looks like they've harnessed that hurt. They've negotiated Galway, which is always tricky. They're their first loss in four or five years, uh, I think, as well, and they're exactly where they want to be. Uh, Dunlai obviously got over Stock Neil, who you you would know uh, from down through the years as well, are a fairly yeah. fairly ser- serious outfit. But you'd probably definitely have Thomas as favourites going into that game. Can I just ask you um, if you had to put your? I know you said you're sitting on the fence, but if you had to, yeah. if you if you had to call how Bally Gunner and Bally Hale uh, were to go, what way would you be leaning? Uh, I think they'll only be a point or two in it anyway. I'll be honest with you. I don't think there'll be a massive gap in, uh, in this game. Look on form, on form alone, you know you 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 look you probably say belly one or by 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 a point or two. I know the belly hill has won't be happy me me saying that, but I hope that'll motivate them more than anything else. Um, but look, it's it's I think it's gonna be very tight. Um, but look, yeah, look, you probably I probably side with the bookies probably at the moment and just 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 go with belly one. But I'm telling you one thing, that's that's it's going to be a tough task uh, for belly one. I can tell you that. I, I would be the same and I no more than yourself would be interested in the horses and you would be looking at the farm and yeah. I think the farm does say Bally Gunner but are you the same as me where there's some good instinct that says that Bally Hale are going to rise a couple of levels yeah. based on February based on the hurt based on just the, it's kind of something I don't know it's some sort of an instinct where I do think they'll produce something that we haven't seen yet this year and maybe that we haven't seen at all in the last couple of years yeah, look, I think there's one massive game in them because I'd imagine, you know, after this year, I could see, you know, one or two lads maybe doing other things or whatever, going traveling again. And, you know, it's their 50th anniversary as well. And I just think there's a lot of things coming into play here. Like, if I was the outsider looking in here and, you know, kind of knowing both teams, you know, I'm saying there's one massive game coming here now, like, you know. Um, and that's why that's why you you can you can never write off Belly Hill. You just can't write them off because they're such a dangerous team. And on any given day, like I said, they can come out with that mean performance and they can just blow you away. Like, um, and don't be surprised if that's not next Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I think I I I can't wait for it. To me, it's a it's a monster game. Uh, again, unfortunately, it collides with the World Cup, but so be it. We'll we'll just have to get on with it. And. James, you've obviously had loads of success at club level with the likes of Carrig Tool and Father O'Neill's and Bally Hale, but you're after taking the hot seat with the Waterford Miners next year. I'd imagine, as you know, a former Waterford defender back in the day, I'd imagine it's mm. something that, that's hugely exciting for you. It is. Look, it's something that I never saw myself doing uh, up to a couple of months ago, I'd be honest with you. And it was only, we'd say, there two or three months ago now, um, the county board made contact with me and said, look, could we sit down and see, would you be interested in doing this? So, again, now to something that I never saw myself training younger players, I'll be honest with you. I've always been involved with adult teams and senior teams and what have you. So, I wasn't too sure how would I how would I adapt to it more than anything else, you know, and how would they adapt to me. But um, 
plan. I'm in there now, look, the last the last month or two, and at the moment, look, we're, we're, we're so I'll, it's a trial period with players and what have you. Uh, we're just doing a little bit of training, but uh, I have to say I'm really, really enjoying it. Like, you know, it's amazing the contrast from the from, you know, from the older player um, to the younger lads who are just like sponges. And if you ask them to stand on their head, they'll probably do it for you. So it's great. It's great in that respect. Like, you know, and, you know, you know, and look at club level as well, you know that, you know, you only probably have 25 or 6. And you're trying to mind that 25 or 6. You know, at the moment I have 44 or 5 in. And, you know, you know unfortunately, I might have to leave lads go, you know, in another month or two. But... It's great to be in that position, but and at the moment, I have to say, I'm I'm really really enjoying it. What would the what would the wear? I don't know if weariness is the right word, but of having coached adults all your life, what would the just the uh, going into the unknown, training young fellas, and you know, it's probably yeah. it's a, bit, a bit of a different world, isn't it? It is, and like, but like, I look, I have a very good team around me again, and a, a couple of very good coaches with me. And to be honest with you, I'm a real hands on type of manager then, where I'm in doing the coaching as well and, and the physical side of it. But I will say, like, I went in with the attitude that I was going to train them like a senior team. I'll be honest, I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to dilute everything that I had been doing over the last number of years because I said, look, that's the wrong way to go about it. Go in as if they're senior players. So a couple of them have got a, a bit of a rude awakening already, I have to say. But like I think that look that I think that'll stand them, you know, over the next over the next uh, three or four months and, you know, hopefully you know, hopefully come into a monster find again or maybe or something like that. Yeah. Liam Cattle came out with the great quote when he was Tipperary manager. Um I think it was Every parent thinks that their their little Johnny is like they think that their yeah. goose is a swan or whatever it is. I think he got a fair bit of but it is um it's probably you know preparing them for adult hurling maybe a bit more. You can't really sugarcoat things too much. But uh best of luck with that, James. And uh probably on Sunday you, you can't win, you can't lose either. So at yeah. least you're gonna you're gonna have a hand in the in the All Ireland final no matter what. But thanks a million for joining us. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Not at all, Shane. Thanks a million. Thanks, cheers, James. Come on. Delighted uh, to be joined now by uh, Wexford Camogie legend Ursula Jacob. Ursula, how are you? How are you? Good, good, good. Um, we'll move on to the Camogie in a second, Ursula, but I know I'd say you can't wait for these games on Sunday as well, particularly that Bally Gun or Bally Hale game. It's, it, like it's, it's the, the cream of the, the club crap facing off against each other. And I think it's the, the fixture we were all waiting for and hoping for as a neutral anyway, because... Um, you know, we're so we're so lucky and fortunate to still have such exciting, brilliant games to look forward to, you know, uh, on the 18th of December, a week before Christmas. So look at uh, two of the best teams in the last number of years coming head to head. We all know how last year's final, well, this, well back in March, how the final finished. And I suppose uh, Bally Hale are going to be still hurting from that. Um, and Bally Gunner are going to be looking to drive on and, and really imprint themselves in history as one of the best teams out there so it's going to be a really exciting battle I love watching both teams they're all out hurling um you know they're they really go from it from the start and they've some of the best players ever you know TJ Reid, Desi Hutchison um Owen Cody like we can go through both teams yeah. and they're sprinkled with so much talent and as a neutral I just can't wait for the game on Sunday. Uh, just based on maybe Bally Gunner and the Pearshig and even, you know, parts of Bally Gunner and Bally A, it does look like the club game has gone to another level. And I think on Sunday, potentially, we could see a club game reaching another level again, levels of physicality, levels of skill. Um, it, and it's great to see. And there's, it's, while, you know, Bally Gunner are marginal favourites, the hurt that Bally Hale bring to the table, ha, you know, they were going for history, something no team had ever done in three in a row. There's so many unknowns going into Sunday, isn't there? You just don't know what to expect really exactly. I've said it before and I've said it about Kilkenny County team as well. A wounded cat is a dangerous animal and they'll no doubt be really, really hurting from, from that final defeat and losing in such heartbreak and that last minute goal by Harry Ruddle. But look at Ballygunner as well are there on Murray. You know, they had a fantastic Munster Championship campaign. They really just seem to have strength in depth and bringing new guys in every year, even Patrick Fitzgerald, you know, in the Munster final, 1-4. So it's not like they're relying on one one or two players. They've got it right across the board and that experience really tells at this stage in the in the championship. But Bally Hale, you know, they're, they've been there, they've done that, they thrive in Crow Park. Now, look, they'll be very disappointed to have allowed Bally or Kilmacud back into that Leinster final, but mm. still, they got through it. Um, they made life difficult for them themselves, but 
I don't think they're going to need any added motivation going into this game on Sunday. And you can already, you know, the pre-match hype into it, you know, Colin Fenley up against uh, Barry Coughlin, the, the war of words there. So who's going to come out on top? And there's so many intriguing battles right across the field. Um, it's just going to be a brilliant spectacle. Um, and it's great that it's a double header in Crow Park. Isn't that great to see, though, as well? Like, not being smart, you've had loads of rivalries in your own camogie career, and it's grand, and we can all be nice to each other, but that, that, that little bit of needle, he even saw it in the, the camogie rivalry with, uh, with Cork and Kilkenny, you know, just in the handshakes, and you just know that things are, there's, you know, a little, there's spicy things going on behind the scenes, and even, there's gonna, it's going to be tasty on Sunday, and that little bit of needle is there, obviously, from February, and I personally, if I was if I was Colin Fenley's manager, I'd be half bullying that he said anything, and I'd be waiting till after if they, if they win the game. But it has teed it up brilliantly. And uh, I suppose he 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 clearly was speaking from the heart, and uh, he, he he genuinely meant it. And maybe sometimes interviews are just very you know snowflake like, and we, we all just say the cliched thing. But he's clearly still hurting and annoyed from from that speech and. You know, he probably uh, completely said exactly what he was thinking. But, you know, that's the way Colin and, and the likes of these Ballyhale guys are. They're very honest. They're very, you know, competitive. They hate losing. Um, the very same as Bally Gunner. So um, I just think, as you said, it's added that extra bit of spice to the game on Sunday. And I, I just think uh, both teams are just phenomenal to work, watch. First and foremost, as I, as I said already, they're brilliant hurling teams. You know, there is that physicality, there is the tactics, there is everything. But at the end of the day, they're two brilliant teams who are just uh, all out hurling and they'll be going uh, hell for leather at each other on Sunday. And not forgetting St. Thomas's and Dunloy as well. They're there, they're there on merit and they came through, you know, the uh, St. Thomas's five in a row, you know, massive achievement. But they're going to have their own hurt from last year's semi final as well. So, and Dunloy, you know, getting one up eventually on Schlock Neil. So, I think we're in for two really intriguing, exciting battles on Sunday. It's gas, as one of our viewers said there, the Dunloy and uh, St. Thomas's crowd will be loving the fact that all the expectation and pressure is on the other one. But the prize is the same for the winners of, of the two games. It's an All-Ireland final place. If I was to put your uh, if you're to put your head on the block, who do you think could be playing in the All-Ireland final? I think it's the, the second last week in January. Look, I, as I said, I think there are going to be two fantastic games on Sunday. Something's kind of edging me towards St. Thomas's in the first game. I just think maybe that little bit of hurt from losing the semi-final last year will drive them on. They seem like a really united bunch um, and they've consistently performed at a high level the last l- number of years. So I'm, I'm slightly tipping um, St. Thomas's in the first game. And then, look, I think it's very hard to call the second game. If you're really pushing me on it, I, I'm probably slightly edging towards Bally Gunner. I just think um, maybe that they have that added little bit to the to the team this year. I think they're really going to want to back up last year's win and and kind of prove to people that it wasn't just a bit of luck that they won it, uh, that they won because they're an exceptional team. And I think they'll want to do the back to back. But look, no greater obstacle than Bally Hale to lie in their way. So um, it it could very well go down to a draw, and it could go to I don't know if it's extra time or a replay, but. I think it's going to be very, very close. But for me, it's St. Thomas's and Ballygunner. It's funny. There's strong views on you know on one side for Ballygunner and strong views for Ballyhale. And they're just saying to James there, my I would just have an instinctive thing that I think Ballyhale are going to produce something, but I'm still nearly stumping for Ballygunner. But it's a it's a fascinating game. Another fascinating game with a couple of fascinating ones on Saturday. I think you're on duty uh, with RTE for the All Ireland Senior Club Camogie Final. You're obviously playing in it, in it a couple of years ago. The first thing I'll ask is, how have, I, how have you adapted to, uh, you know, retirement and that? And obviously things have changed a fair bit at home for you in recent times as well. Yeah, well, I was just actually saying to my mom the other day that this time last year I was preparing for uh, a club All Ireland against Sarsfields on, on the 18th of December. And this year I'm working in Crow Park after getting married and having a baby. So in a year, <laughs> a lot can happen. Um, and look, at I, I nothing but brilliant memories looking back on my career and time playing with Owlert. And, you know, those those couple of months last year from kind of September to December were, were probably my favourite years, a favourite time playing Camogie because we just seemed to go from a county final win into Leinster Championship and on to the All Ireland. And it was a magical time, you know, Christmas, covid uh, weddings, everything thrown in between. And then to finish off the year winning that All-Ireland was was just brilliant. So 
Uh, and then obviously we got back into the All Ireland then in March to play Sarsfields again. So uh, I think more than others, I, I know Sarsfields like the back of my hand at this stage. And credit to him to come back again now and to be back in another final against first time finalist Lock Eel, who who I've played uh, in the past as well. I played him in two All Ireland semi finals at club level. And when I think back on those games against Lock Eel, they were probably some of the most physically demanding games. And it's what I expect they're going to bring to the game on Saturday evening. Um, you know, they had six years where they, they got beaten by Schlock Neal in that in the Ulster mm. final. And to come back this year, a seven-time, seven-time lucky, to get one up on Schlock Neal is a credit to them. Uh, it's a credit to their club in terms of perseverance, in terms of consistency, in terms of kind of, um, you know, bouncing back from those defeats. And they're here... Uh, after uh, backing up their Ulster final performance and had, having a big win over Drum and Inch in the semi-final. So I think it's going to be a really interesting game. It's obviously uh, Sarsfield's sixth final in seven years. And that's that's incredible too, you know. And they've pretty much the same set of girls playing each of those finals as well. So you can say that Sarsfields are probably going in as overwhelming favourites. Uh, they've the huge amount of experience. But I would turn that on the flip side that Lock Eel... You know, they have so many girls representing Antrim at senior level. And they, they had 14 on the panel with Antrim in, in the Intermediate All Ireland last year. So they've got the, the experience of winning Crow Park too. So I think it's going to be a really, really interesting battle. Just before I focus back in on the game, can I, I'd hazard a guess and say that, that those kind of twilight months of your career, would I be right in saying that they were the best nearly moments of your career the ones you'll cherish most because when you get older and realize the days are numbered you probably yeah. cherish them a bit more 100 percent. i i i was only saying it to i was talking to our manager colin sunderland there actually only earlier today and i was just reflecting back on last year and i i think it's a couple of reasons why i appreciate that that win so much i think first of all we fought so so hard for for those games to take place uh second of all as you said as you're getting closer to the end of your career, I think you have this added appreciation. I knew deep down in my head that at whatever stage we were going to be knocked out of the competition or win the competition, I was going to be finishing finishing up with the club. So I suppose that was in the back of my mind too. And that was maybe added motivation as well that I really just wanted to give it my all for kind of one last uh, hurrah. And thankfully, everything went our way um, in the 2020 championship, which finished off last December. And unfortunately, you're looking for that kind of fairy tale end. And personally, uh, and as a club, you want to win any All Ireland you're in. But you know, I, I suppose playing Sarsfields maybe only eight or nine weeks later, it was very hard to kind of get one up on them again because mm. they were obviously going to learn from losing that final last December, and they did. And you know, um, we we probably didn't perform to our capability, and that was frustrating that we didn't perform to where we could have in Crow Park there in March, but. You'd have to give credit to Sarsfields, their top class team. You know, Hopper McGrath stuck with him, and um, you know they probably deserved that that win in March, uh, like we did last December. I'm glad you mentioned the Hopper. He's obviously uh, he's manager of the Sarsfields. Um, his daughters, Neve, uh, Clara, Siobhan, Kira, and Arla. I think Arla is injured. They have another sister, Leisha, who's 15, who will be eligible to step up next year, uh, where they probably have six uh, McGrath siblings involved. Like, it's a phenomenal family, really, isn't it? And, and like Orla, as you mentioned, you know, uh, unfortunately did her cruciate earlier this year, and she's a huge, huge loss. You know, she's a senior intercounty player, an all-star winner, and she's one of the uh, leaders on this team, and she's a huge loss. And you could see... In the semi-final against Vincent's, um, how much she was missed because she is not only capable of scoring, she creates so many of the scores. She's the link player between her sisters, Neve and Claude in midfield. And then she's kind of, um, she's got so much pace, pace and skill and presence around that half forward line um, that she really is a huge, huge loss. You can't underestimate how much of a loss she is because, as I said, she... She's not only one of their top scorers over the last number of years, she just creates so much of the attacking presence as well. And, you know, maybe some of the onus is is is, is going on to, to Siobhan now in the full forward line. And I felt in the semi-final, when she was positioned and moved out to the half forward line, that kind of was the turning point for me because I felt they weren't maybe getting the ball into her enough. She wasn't in the game as much as Sarsfields wanted in that in that first half in particular. And when she came out in the half-forward line, 
she created and set up the, the penalty. She took the penalty and she got a couple of great points from play as well. So she's vital to this team on Sunday. Neve midfield kind of orchestrates everything for me. She controls everything midfield. She's the engine on this team. And Cloda's role is probably uh, goes understated as, as well because she very much sits back on the half back line. And that allows Maria Cooney, then half yeah, centre back, to sit back in front of the full back line. And that's going to be really, really crucial because Lockheed's most dangerous line is that full forward line. You know, you've got Annie Lynn who got player of the match the last day. She got player of the match in the county final. Roshi McCormick, full forward, who's one of the top class uh, players at club play at club level, but also at inter-county level. Mm. Um, and she is just a top class player. And then you've got Katrine Dobbin, who is a real goal poacher. She got one one in the in the can- or in the the semi final, but also at Ant- with Antrim, I've watched her over the last couple of years, and she's a really really a strong player inside. So Sarsfields are going to have to be wary of that. Um, it's one thing, you know, that they're going to be looking to stop uh, Lockheel from doing. Lockheel got three goals in that semi-final. If you look at the two All-Ireland finals that we played them in March and last year, we got four goals in both of those finals. So uh, Sarsfields will be very, very conscious of that, that they can't leak as many goals as that because if not, it'll put them under extreme pressure. Okay, brilliant. I've actually done the McGraths at this service as well because their mother Geraldine played hockey for Ireland as well. So they were getting they were getting it from both from both sides. Um, just I'm just wondering of... how many of them there is, is more to come into the team because if not, it'll be just a a, a team of McGraths uh, in in the in the next few years. That's a fact. Yeah. Uh, just a couple yeah. of quick quick ones here. Uh, a Sully 180, who's actually the Burr manager, uh, uh, Ursula, who wasn't wouldn't be happy with your cohort when they landed down to Burr or they landed down to play in the Leinster Championship <laughs> this year. But he just said Sarah Spellman was a big loss in the half hour line the last day too, and he's just talking about Siobhan McGrath. Siobhan was excellent when she came out to centre forward last week. I think Vincent's beat ye by a point. I'd be right in saying. Um, Sarsfields beat Vincent's by a point the last day. Um, are you expecting this to be very tight on, on Saturday evening? So, because um, I think Lockheed are coming in in a really good position. You know, all the talk will be of Sarsfields and their experience and they've been there and done that. And as I said, this is Lockheed's first appearance in, in a senior club All-Ireland. So, they're probably coming in a, a, in a nice position and um, there's not probably a, a huge amount of pressure on them because um, as I said, all the talk and focus will be, can Sarsfields do the back-to-back? You know, they won the, the most recent All-Ireland in March. They've probably got uh, the sprinkle of more senior inter-county players and experience. And as Adrian just mentioned there, you know, Sarah Spellman, Maria Cooney, Tara Kenny. You can name so many of these Sarsfields players. But I look at the Lock Eel team as well. And uh, for me, they've got some really top-class leaders on this team who who really will put it up to Sarsfields. I think the midfield battle for me is the is the big one. Uh, as I said, Neve McGrath is the engine of the the Sarsfields team. She she just orchestrates everything that goes into that uh, forward line for Sarsfields. Claude McGrath's role can't be understated. As I said, she kind of sits in front of the half back line. But they're coming up against Lockheels joint captains Amy Boyle and Lucia McNaughton. And the two of those girls, you know, are senior players for Antrim. They're athletic, they're fast, they're fit, they're well able to hurl, and they're very capable of scoring. And they're able to cover a huge amount of ground. I suppose my one concern and worry is how will Lockheel adapt to the surroundings of Crow Park? Yes, they've played there before with Antrim, but when you're playing at club level, and I know this myself, it is, Crow Park is different than any other pitch in Ireland for many reasons. And it's just not letting the occasion get to them. It's not letting the whole game get into them. And it's kind of playing without that kind of fear uh, and, and really embracing the challenge of it as well. And it's getting a good start will be key for Lock Eel because um, I know from playing Sarsfield, you have to get that quick start on them because if not, like we saw against them in, in March in the final, they got a lightning quick start. Siobhan McGrath had a goal within two minutes and it kind of put us on the back foot straight away. So Lock Eel will be trying to keep it nice and tight at the back and trying to get the quick start that that Sarsfields have got in, in some of the previous games. Can I just ask you, was um, 
was Nolan Park perfect for you in a way in comparison to Crow Park, even just with regards to maybe age profile and things like that and a tighter ground and that type of, that's not I'm not ageist in any way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um no, I, I I just think it I, I as I said, I just think Crow Park is different. I think if we had played Sarsfields in Crow Park last December, I think how we were performing in the weeks leading up to that game and the morale in the group and how we were set up and we got our tactics right, I think we we would have come on top. We would have come on top of uh, Sarsfields anywhere, and that's not being cocky. That's not being whatever. I just think we were in the right frame of mind. We tactically had our our game plan set up. We had our our um, our uh, tactics and everything, you know, perfect for the game. I think you know, come March when we played them again, as I said, I think the biggest thing was Sarsfields learned so much from that defeat mm. last December. Um, yes, I think they probably had the greater experience of playing in Crow Park in comparison to some of our younger girls. Um, but, you know, I don't think it was a huge factor. I wouldn't take away from the fact that, you know, uh, we were an older age and team last December. But Crow Park can be different at, at club level, especially for some of the younger girls who maybe have an experience playing in, in that bigger pitch. Perfect. Just a, a brief uh, a brief look at the All Ireland Intermediate final. It's Clonduff against James Stevens, the uh, All Ireland Club Junior uh, semi final. I think it is Adair against Radini Oga. Just James Stevens beat uh, it was a Castle Gar last weekend. Um, any opinion on this on that final, Ursa? That's obviously the that's the the appetizer for the the main course of Sarsfields and Lochiel. Yeah, and I think it's going to be another another great um, game. I think for me, Clonduff probably have the little bit more edge and experience. They've been here before. Um, you know, I, I still look at Sarah Louise Graffin playing and Fanula Carr. I and mean, when you see these girls still playing at such a high level, I think Fanula's playing 20 plus years with her club and she's still performing at a high level. So it's fantastic. It's great that it's a double header. And I'd really encourage people to get in and watch the two games and go up and support the girls because I think... Um, the standard of Camogie, you, you just spoke about the standard at club hurling level. The standard at club Camogie level, whether it's senior, intermediate, junior, um, it, it, it's gone to the next level. And it's fantastic to see that these games are getting um, to get, get to play in a pitch like, like Crow Park. And just to give a little mention to Delvin, who are in the junior BR Ireland, my husband's from there. So I, I need to give them a shout out, out that hopefully they'll be victorious on Sunday as well. Uh, a Sully 180 just says uh, he thinks Quiva Costello will light up the junior final. He's also very thankful that you weren't playing that day in St. Brennan's St. Bren St. Park. Uh, just a bit, a bit of feedback from one of our viewers there. Fla just says, get Ursula more often. She's great. Um, and there was another comment in here, just something I wanted to touch on. Um, you've obviously spoken about this online, Ursula, but James S. just says, please ask Ursula to raise awareness for the online nonsense and bullying spouted against her uh, and her accent. You obviously... Um, I, I not it was a, a good few months back, probably around the time of the All Ireland final. -ish, but can you just talk to me about that? Um, I'd be very selective about what I would take in or even notice on Twitter, just because there is an awful lot of nonsense out there. But you've obviously have had some bad experiences, and it's an important to raise awareness about it as well. I suppose it's not it's not just about Ursula Jacob. I'm sure if any of us, whether it was you, Michael, or anyone else, that a search for our name on Twitter or wherever, we'd probably see bad stuff. Um, and I suppose it just got to the stage where I really just felt enough was enough. And um, it just was affecting me on my in my personal life. I was getting upset. I was finding myself that I wasn't enjoying it to the same way. And I love speaking about Harlan, Camogie, GA. I, it's been part of my life, all of my life. And it just got to the stage where I just said, you, 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 sometimes, yeah, people saying to you, just stay silent, ignore them, ignore them. But sometimes you do need to call out people. Um, and I know that there's still nasty um, cowards out there who'll probably write more stuff about me and others uh, going forward in the next couple of years. But I do feel like I've kind of gained back some of the power because um, it's sometimes it's you have to stand up for what's right. You have to stand up for yourself. And I do feel better for it. And as I said at the time, I'm not looking to change my voice, my accent, where I'm from. I'm Wexford true and true. I'm Owler true and true. And I'm very proud of that fact. And also, like, you know, some people just can't move past the, the thing that a woman is speaking about the men's game or that you, Michael, is speaking about, about uh, a camogie game. I don't mm. see any difference. Like, you and me can have a conversation here chatting about the hurling games and the camogie games. To me, it doesn't matter 
as long as I'm knowledgeable, I can back up my opinion. I've no problem in anyone disagreeing with what I'm saying. Everyone's open to criticism, but it's when it gets personal and tasteless and they're just trying to target you for no good reason. Um, as I said at the time, at least I'm brave enough to go on television or to come on a podcast or go on the radio and give my opinion and put my name behind it and back myself up on it. They're the ones who are hiding behind a computer screen or a phone and, and they can't even put their real name behind yeah. it. They have to set yeah. up a, yeah. a page. So to me, I, I think reflecting back on it, I'm, I, it's probably one of the things I'm most proud of that I actually took a stand and said, look, it's not, it's not on, it's not right. And I'm hoping even if it made one or two people think going forward, would they say that to me or anyone else on the street? Would they say it to my face? Probably not. So it's just kind of making people more aware think before they type i'm a human like anyone else i've got feelings i have a thick skin but when it gets to the personal side of things i i i, I won't stand for it and that's why i really just kind of really voiced my opinion at the time and it probably didn't help that i was you know quite pregnant at the time and i was feeling you know just i suppose i was thinking of the bigger picture that i was going to be welcoming a, a child into the world and would i would i stand for someone um, you know, criticizing my child, I wanted to stand up for myself and kind of do them proud as well. So look at um hopefully some people will learn from the experience, but I have to say I am proud that I did stand up for myself. No, without a doubt. Um I think it does make a difference for other people as well. Uh Fergus Butler just says fair play to Ursula for speaking up. Online abuse is disgusting across the board. Um John Quan has a bit of uh, feedback and then a question he asked. Jacob Zara, he just says, Jacob's are a great hurling camogie family. And he said, ask Ursula who is the best hurler, Mick, <laughs> Rory or Michael or, your, or yourself. Oh, God, I definitely won't be saying myself. Uh, do you know what? I'll, I'll, I think I'll, I'll be nice to my father and I'll, I'll give him the nod on that one. Um, I won't rank him, but I'll, I'll back him up because if, if I don't say him, he'll be given out to me. So um, in fairness, look, we've all... We've all been uh, heavily involved in, in hurling camogie all our lives. And my mom represented Wexford as well, and my sister Helena. So um, look at it. We've been steeped in GEA all our lives. So um, I'll go with daddy on this one. I'd hate to cause a family fight. Well, you're dead <laughs> right not to rank them because I was asked in a WhatsApp group to rank uh, in terms of hurling ability, three lads within the group. And I put one of my I put one of my best mates at number three for a joke, and he's hardly spoken to me since. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, well, well, look, Christmas is coming up, so I want to receive an old Christmas present from the brothers. So I'll 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 go with Daddy anyway. He'll be happy with me. Just a quick comment from Richard Hogan. He just said, different perspectives are good for all sports. It's very healthy. Glad to see that calling this out has made her feel better. It's important not to allow it to get bottled up. Yeah, I think um, it's uh, like. Like, I don't expect anyone to agree with me. You don't expect anyone to agree with you. We'll have a healthy debate. I'll respect your opinion. You'll respect my opinion. But, you know, there'll be no, you know, personal attacks or anything like that. Funnily enough, first, it might, what's on the top of my head is why I get, why I get abuse about most. Uh, <laughs> I've been called Mexican. I've been called every, everything and anything over the last while. But it's like uh, it's like water off a duck's back to me. Um, Just if you were to call... Michael, if, to, yeah, to on. be honest, just to say one thing there, like players these days, they have enough to be dealing with, but it's just gone to another level. Like no one goes out to have a bad game. Ah, yeah. And like, it's just, you know, this is a bigger picture and a bigger problem that's really out there. And, you know, as I said, it's not about Ursula Jacob getting abused, but it's about the wider picture and like players going out to do their best. No one goes out to have a bad game. And the minute, the minute something goes wrong within 30 seconds on Twitter, it's all over the place about a certain player. And that's just completely wrong too. Yeah, and even, you know, video clips and different things flying around of, you know, people or whatever. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Uh, Ursula, thanks a million for joining us. And uh, I, we look forward to watching the coverage on Saturday evening. I hope they're, uh, hope they're two great games. Fancy Sarsfield's just about myself, but Lock Eeler, Lock Eeler, a tough outfit. So it's going to be an interesting game. Thanks very much for joining us. And no doubt we'll talk to you again soon. No bother. Thank you. Cheers, Ursula. Great to have Ursula Jacob uh, with us there. Uh, lots of other bits and pieces of news that we need to get through. And uh, just a quick one as well before before we go on. Um, obviously, for you can get all your uh, our store, all your our game merchandise on our store.e. All t-shirts, bobble hats, you name it, for all different counties. Perfect stocking fillers, phone covers, uh, bottles. Look at these. 
uh, swanky shoes, um, loads of different uh, gear associated with all different counties and different sports as well. And the old nuts to a monkey mug, which I have here myself, uh, my favorite coffee or water cup at this stage. Uh, just going to fly through another uh, couple of quick bits of news. Keep your comments coming in. Uh, we'll get through them all before the end of the show. Um, so just an interesting one there, Barry Hennessy's retirement in Limerick. So probably, you know, maybe not the most well-known goalkeeper because he was under study to Nicky Quaid the whole way nearly throughout his career. But he started out under Justin McCarthy, was there some 13 years uh, and has stepped away. And it kind of is an interesting question it's created. While Nicky Quaid is the clear number one within within uh, Limerick, you know, who is maybe the number two or even the number three at the moment? So just from chatting to a few fellas down around Limerick, David McCarthy would look to be one of the obvious choices for uh, understudy to Quaid. Now, he was the third keeper last year and played good bits of the Munster League. He might step up to be the understudy now. Jason Glan, younger brother of Aaron, was the third keeper in 2020 and 2021. And I believe he played uh, in goals for Patrick's well this year, having played outfield in previous years. So that might help his case maybe to get called back into the squad. Uh, and Conor Handy clark who was the goalie with the Limerick under-20s, would definitely be another option. I think he's fresher in UL at the moment. Uh, obviously, son of uh, former Limerick All-Star Dave Clark as well. Um, definitely need to pay um, kudos to Ross Munley as well after hanging up his boots 20 years with the Leash footballers. I think he played under 10 different managers, played 222 competitive games, obviously finished with that one Leinster medal when Mikko was their manager in 03. I think it was um, an unbelievable career. Uh, it was probably maybe a bit power player in recent years, but I, to me, I'd probably admire him even more, knowing the fact that the last couple of years that he wasn't going to start, but he stayed around, offered stuff, offered a lot from the bench and would have offered a lot, I'd say, to a lot of young uh, Leash players. So he's been an absolutely incredible servant uh, to Leash football. So a big hat tip to Ross Munley there. Uh, there was another big retirement as well in Westmead. Jor Egan, former captain of the Westmead footballers and an absolutely brilliant forward, has been you know really hurt by injuries in recent years. But he's after calling time on his Westmead career as well. A great career. The, the pity those injuries kind of uh, halted him the last couple of years, but great to see that he came on the last few minutes of that Talton Cup final this year, got his day out in Crow Park and... Yeah, his last appearance for Westmead would have been in Crow Park. So um, he definitely can't, can't complain with where he finished up his career. Same with Ursula, I think, as well. She finished up her career uh, in Crow Park too. So if you're going to retire, it's, the, it's definitely the, the place you'd like to probably retire most, barring maybe your own, uh, your own home ground. Um, today is obviously the 10-year anniversary of the passing of the one and only uh, Paddy O'Shea as well. Just going to get up a brief little quick clip here. I think when we talk about um, when we talk about you know someone being synonymous with certain words or a certain clip, I definitely would have to say that that party is synonymous with the clip from the documentary Marooned uh, when he was with Westmead. You know some of the some of the you know best probably GA documentaries that have been ever done in recent years. Uh, I'm just going to bring that up briefly here. Just have a quick, uh, a quick look at, it. and uh, just for anybody that's watching, you might, um, you might count the amount of times he uses the f word in it. Um, needless to say, he uses it uh, plenty, plenty of times within it. But uh, it's one of those absolutely brilliant clips. I'm just going to play it here now. Well, lads, but lads. Bring the bit of fucking development into your play the next day now on the tigerish play. The discipline, the tightness, the the the, 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 the rough and tumble stuff all around the middle of the field, the fucking breaking ball, and a, a grain of rice is going to tip the scale. Just remember that, lads. A grain of rice will tip the scale. But you'll have to get steely tough upstairs, and you must be willing to fucking break your gut. You were fucked over the line twice. Fucked you over the line like you'd catch a fucking loaf of bread and fucked you over the line with his shorts up. And what that does is, it lifts the opposition. We don't want to see no West Meat man fucked about. Is that clear now, Alan? No more. You will have to be closer. Closer to fuck. We'd have to fucking crash into these fellas and test out their fucking pulse. Because I'm telling you, lads, these fellas that play good football if they're allowed. Give me one fucking guarantee each and every one of you that you're going to be tighter that you're going to be more disciplined, that you're going to be more tigerish, 
and that you're going to take the fucking game to these fellas. That these fellas will get such a fucking shell shock next Saturday evening that we'll put them back in their fucking asses for fucking 10 years. All right, then. Yeah, for me, one of the one of the great GA clips. I have to say, I counted fifteen f bombs, but I might have missed one. Um, there could well be sixteen. But what an absolute legend, Paddy O'Shea was. Unfortunately, um, sadly gone before his time. But an absolute legend, both on and off the pitch. Just going to fly through a couple of quick comments here. Paddy Gray says, uh, "Bally Hale by six to seven points." Um, Richard Hogan just says, Dermot Burns doing a bit of travelling. Interesting to see how he will return to the squad after his break. Pat Ryan will have a point to prove and could see him looking to hit the ground running. Yeah, Pat Ryan back in the squad as well. Dermot Burns heading away to Dubai for six weeks in the new year as well. Uh, we'll miss the first two rounds of the league, but we should be back around to play the third, fourth and fifth. Probably come back around the fourth game. He's going to be back at least two months, I think, before the, um, before the championship. So it should be back in plenty of time. Um, ML89 just says, What a servant to Leash Ross Munley was. Now that he is retired, is there a current player in Leinster apart from Dublin with a Leinster Senior Football Championship? Uh, no, there's not. Uh, Mead would have been the last one in 2010, and I think all those lads have since moved on. I think Niall McNamee is the longest serving player remaining with a, a county team, and his future with Offaly is you know, not yet sure either. So um, Richard Hogan says, Joe, is there any new players that would be excited to see for Kilkenny in the early season competi competition with the in the Walsh Cup? A lot of new players involved with Kilkenny. Um, Derek Ling's working off a big squad, so it's going to be fascinating to see what players are on show. James S says, Paddy is a legend. Uh, poor Alan Mangan. I tell you, it, Richard, it definitely had the desired effect because I think Alan Mangan was man of the match the next day. He kicked four points. Um, he sprung a man into action a man of the match the next day he was absolutely brilliant the next day uh joe butler just says brilliant clip typical party um fergus butler first name on the team sheet if you were to create a great team of players from the grail talked yeah grail talked he he says uh james says, i love to say all right lads and he just they just all kind of tip away but uh he was absolutely brilliant words still have uh other few bits and pieces to get through uh, before we finish up, obviously, Derek Burns is away, as we said, and Pat Ryan is back in the Limerick squad. Uh, no return, no Kilkenny return for Dara Joyce. So he, the uh, former all Ireland winner, minor captain, he set to continue his career in Australia with Collingwood's VFL team. So he had returned and played a bit of club for the Roar in Steeg, but he's back in Australia now. Uh, a couple of other quick bits and pieces. Uh, we obviously have the All Ireland Club Intermediate Semi Finals this weekend as well. Toreen, uh, the Mayo and Connacht champion, champions against Leitrim, the Down and uh, Ulster champions, that's in Kingspan, Breffney on Saturday, and Moline play Bray Emmett on Sunday in Tullamore in the other semi final. Just a couple of quick little bits on Moline because it's kind of a fascinating story. Mo uh, managed by Owen Brislan from Tip, they actually have an all Tip backroom team. So when Owen trains a team or manages a team, he brings in his own guys, so they've their own his own S and C, his own goalkeeping coach, his own selector, and I think he has another coach involved with him as well. But Moline were relegated from the senior ranks last year, and you know I think it's uh, you know a real good lesson to any other team. Sometimes teams can slide out of the picture when they're relegated. Moline uh, they set up a six person hurling committee you know in the weeks after six fellas got together uh jed o'dwyer who some people might know from uh the hurlers pub in limerick there uh just in castle troy john toomey john gleason liam scully dermot o'carroll and eamon cosgrove all come together they set up a committee they basically uh, interviewed all of the players on a one-to-one -one basis got feedback from them of what needed to happen for the year forward and you know s and c and a few other bits and pieces was mentioned but on brazan just said it's unheard of really six people that had no investment with the club in any official position for the love of moline they came together and said we're in a bit of a crisis here we shouldn't be in this crisis so what's wrong so on brazan actually wasn't even in place as manager while the squad were going through this rigorous eight-week training program in the fit 100 gym on the Bally simon road and he said you know, they didn't have a panel of 35, I think they had an 85% attendance rate. This was eight weeks before Christmas. Like this, oh, the past season was only just finished and they were back training. He said when he was, you know, called and, you know, inquired about whether he'd love to get involved. He said he'd love to get involved with this team it was what was a project team of loads of underage players coming through. I think there's 13 players that have gone through the Limerick Academy 
and he enlisted the help of Tip Natives, Trevor Galvin, who's coach, Paul Tracy, SNC, Dermot Gleeson, who's a selector, and Kevin Cummins, who's a goalkeeping coach. So they've all come into Monlean and they're Limerick Premier Intermediate Champions, they're obviously Munster Champions as well. He just says, it just clicked. I was coming from Tommy Vara and I was looking for a project that rather than a one-year job, we were looking for a team that we could go in and basically bring them through the ranks and coach them. They've definitely done that. Their average age is 21.2, which is amazingly young. And Brazan said that the goal within the club is to try and win a Limerick senior title within the next 10 years with the amount of talent they have to come through and the age profile. Definitely say they have a decent chance of doing it. And in Captain Larkin Lyons and Andrew Latouche Cosgrove, they have players that are obviously involved in the Limerick 2018 All-Ireland winning squad as well. Latouche Cosgrove has had you know a really, really hard time with injury. He got an operation on an Achilles uh, earlier this year, maybe April or May, but he's been back recently. He started that win over Ross Gray the last day. And interestingly, Brazam will have a bit of inside info on the Bray lads. He actually coached uh, Wicklow and Bray star John Henderson at college level when he was in DIT. So he's well aware of what uh, the Wicklow lads can do. In the All-Ireland Junior semi-finals, really interesting. The, I'm particularly focused on the, the meeting of Eski against Kilburn and Gales. Um, Eski beat Ballygar five points to four in the Connacht final, played in absolutely awful conditions. And Eski's probably more known as like a surfing town, but they've uh, made massive strides in hurling in recent years. So their captain, Bernard Feeney, just said it's a huge achievement for a club to win Connacht because we're only starting back up again to get over this hurdle. We were in the Connacht final last year and it just didn't go our way. We learned from it and brought the lessons into this year. And he just mentioned Andrew Kilcullen in particular, who's a serious, serious talent. He was on the Christy Ring, uh, Nicky Rackard and Laurie Maher, Team of the Year. Interesting one as well. They're playing Kilburn Gales, who are obviously based in London. But the Eastkey manager, um, uh, I can't think of his name here. Actually, I have it. Uh, Michael Gordon is his name. He's actually living in London and commuting back. So uh, Feeney, the captain, said he'd be coming back over doing uh, training and games maybe once a week. Uh, Brian Healy is our trainer and takes sessions during the week. It's clearly working, but that's because of the passion Michael Gordon and people in the club have to make things happen. No stone is left unturned. He says there's messages in the WhatsApp, there's calls. There's always something happening between trainings and organising things. So for Sligo, who've made a great rise at county level, to have a team potentially in an all Ireland club final in Crow, in Crow Park would be absolutely huge. I think they're going to be up against it, though, because Kilburn Gales had a great win over Satanta from Donegal in the Ulster twin and final. They beat them. Uh, I think the twin and final is like uh, the winners of Ulster playing the London winners uh, and they call it a final, but I think it's like a de facto All-Ireland quarter final. So they beat them 3-12 to 17 points that day. Interesting one for their goalkeeper, actually. Conor McNally's from Bray. He only transferred over this year. So he's playing in an All-Ireland junior semi-final for Kilburn Gales and his own club, Bray, are playing an All-Ireland Intermediate Final the same weekend, which is a bit mad. Uh, the journalist, Patrick Early, who you all might know, he was a uh, part of that Galway uh, GA podcast with uh, David Connors of the Toome Herald. He plays at midfield. He's a key man for them. Tom Bergen from TIP has been over them the last 10 years, uh, and former Galway panellist Brian Regan is training them. Um, I did an interview with Brian a few years ago. Brian got a heart attack, actually, in Rice playing a game about three or four years ago. Um, and only for being resuscitated by some nurses who were in attendance at the match. His heart actually stopped for six to seven minutes, uh, and I think he has uh, a built-in defibrillator now in his chest just in case anything ever happens, but great to see him still involved uh, with Kilburn. He's uh, He's been with Kilburn since he moved over to London, I think. Key players for Kilburn Gales, Mark Dwyer from Carrick Shock. He played in an All-Ireland Intermediate Final for the Shockaroos a few years back. Donny Rail plays for him as well. Brother of Damien, uh, the great cornerback from Limerick. Uh, and Fergal Collins from Ballina in Tip. He's a uh, first cousin of the trainer, Fergal O'Brien, the horse trainer. And I believe he rides out for him at the weekend. So he's a diminutive midfielder who rides out for his cousin and top trainer at the weekend. That's a, a bit of a mad one. I don't think you have too many GAA players who are also uh, riding work for, you know, one of the best trainers in the country. So that's going to be a really interesting game. On the other side then, you have Bally Giblin against uh, Horswood. Bally Giblin are probably all Ireland favourites going into it. So uh, a hat trick from newlywed Shane Beston inspired Bally Giblin to back to back junior titles the last day. Beston ended up with 3 3. They're coming up against Horswood, who had a right good win over commercials in the Leinster final. They were behind for most of the game. They've had back to back promotions in Wexford. Uh, their key players would be Captain Shane O'Hanlon, Connor Foley, Jack Kyo, and Sean Nolan. They're their key men in attack. 
a uh, couple of other bits and pieces. Um, Fitzgibbon Cup draw was made. Um, some particular Group B, I think, was particularly tasty when I looked at. It. So you have Jamie Walls, Mary I, uh, IT Carlo, and DCU. Very, very tasty. Uh, Group C as well. Manute, UCC, UCD. Group D, UL, uh, ATU Galway, and TUS Midwest. That's the old LIT. And Group A is NUAG, uh, managed by Jeff Linsky, MTU Cork, and Waterford IT. Uh, Sigerson Cup draw as well, which is knockout, MTU Kerry, the ATU Sligo, all these um, college names changing, um, it was always IT Sligo, it was always Trilly IT back in the day, but they've all changed, uh, Carlo versus St Mary's, NUIG versus Minute, MTU Cork versus UCD, Queens against Ulster University, which I'm reliably informed by Carol Kane is known as the Bell Classico, which I particularly like, ATU Donegal, who I think have Michael Murphy involved with them, who recently retired, uh, Donegal star. They're playing DCU, managed by Paddy Christie, ATU Galway versus TU Dublin, and UCC versus UL. They're, that's a fair clash between UCC and UL, and it's good to see that some colleges just keep, to, keep their name and they're not messing about with them. So those ties are to be played on the 10th and 11th of January. Uh, other little bits of news, Anthony Cunningham has been announced, been announced as the new Port Harrington manager in recent days. He takes over from Martin Murphy, who's obviously involved with Liam Kearns in Offaly. Uh, football, one tie this weekend, the Ulster Intermediate Final, Galbally Pierces against Cardiff. And in the ladies' football, again, one game that I think is carrying over from last weekend that was postponed. It's the All-Ireland Junior Club Final, Nave Abbon against uh, Salt Hill Nakara. I think we have most things, I think we have most things covered from uh, the week, the weekend. I'll just fly through a few comments before we go. Um, Parra Grace just says, Horswood v Ballygiblin Sunday in Dungarvan. Yeah, down in Friar Field. Richard says, uh, or Joe Butler says, I'd like to see Timmy Clifford involved with Kilkenny. Timmy was very good for the Kilkenny 20s. Um, what a legend party is, Nulty Jack says. Mona Lean and Bray, yeah, really looking forward to that one as well. And Richard Hogan also says, big weekend for Toreen, Joe. Toreen to book their place in a, an All-Ireland Intermediate Final to be huge for Hurling and Toreen, but it'll also be huge for Hurling and Mayo. Uh, P. Well, 74, Mona Lean have the biggest numbers underage and they're with huge potential if they can get organised. Definitely looks like they have got organised anyway. Um, Parik Grace just says, Bray, serious shout, strong form, beating two teams that bet the two favourites in Leinster. Yeah, they, you know, not they didn't win pulling up against Trim, but you'd have to say they were impressive against them. Trim had taken out Dainsford and Tullamore before that. Um, Richard Hogan says, Bally Giblin are strong, but again, Horsers won't be a pushover, especially with Ty Furlong propping them up. Uh, you never, I, I doubt it, but uh, you never know. He's obviously Horswood's uh, most famous son. James S says, nice Irish expat gang in Kilburn, including the brother. Ah, very good. Any more information on Kilburn Gales? James S, we'd gladly take it. Uh, Donna Myler has mixed both Hurling and Jockey Ship. He surely has. There was actually... Uh, I can't, his, can't think of his name offhand, but there was a guy who was involved with the Glen last year. Definitely, um, is right now as an amateur jockey, I think as well, or maybe a conditional jockey. Um, Yellow Belly TV. Bill Redmond says Messi corner forward on Sunday. Uh, he be fly, he be flying. Shane O'Hanlon for Horswood is a cousin of Wexford fullback Matt O'Hanlon. I'm told from ML89. Uh, Joe gives me a little tap in the back. Well done, Michael. Another good show. Without the yeah, without, without the football, I know you're a hurling man. First and foremost, Joe ML eighty nine says uh, Salt Hill appearing in their third code of an All Ireland Camogie ladies football and men's football. Yeah, it's a serious um, it is a serious achievement. SSRI great chat and analysis. Yeah, delighted to have James O'Connor and Ursula um with with me today. It was absolutely brilliant. Great insight for uh, from both. Watch out for Connor Foley uh, Horswood. Uh, number five or six and I should have sorry Richard Hogan I missed Mikey Fogarty Mikey actually wrote a winner in Galway the week of the Wexford County final I think it was 2019 so imagine his manager you know the last thing you're worrying about the week of a county final is a guy riding in a race which is probably a lot more dangerous than playing Ireland but Mikey wrote a winner and then played for St Anne's in a Wexford senior hurling final but uh, thanks a million for joining us uh, joining me and joining my two guests today as well the Saint will be back in tow on uh, on Sunday, or a Monday, I should say, for Monday's show, where we'll be looking back on, to me, what is the club hurling game in a decade, and we'll be re reviewing all the action. Thanks a million for joining us, folks. Really, really appreciate it. Always appreciate the support. Go to rstore.ie 
for all uh, the official our game merchandise and don't forget to sign up on the patreon go to patreon.com forward slash our game you can get all the audio for the show uh, and i let the, i let the tune play us out thanks a million folks really really appreciate you joining us today and we'll see you on monday